doesn't matter. Do you want to sit? Do you want to stand? Thank you. I agree. Blessed assurance. <laughs> this seat is mine. Okay. So go ahead, Fresh. Hello. Okay. Okay, I'm on. So the first question is Are the seven spirits of God a separate being slash creature on facets of the Godhead? Facets. Different facets of the Godhead. Okay. Go ahead. No, you taught on that. That's yours. The answer is no. The seven spirits of God is the Holy Spirit. Just like the rainbow. See, when light comes, light is colorless. Or let's presume one color. But when it passes through the prism, you can, it is diffused into seven colors. So the Holy Spirit is like that. He is sevenfold manifestations. But it is not a different facet of God or different facet of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit himself. Amen. You want okay. to add on to that? No, I agree with the man on the right. <laughs> Can you explain more of the seven spirits of God? It is a very exhaustive teaching that cannot be explained in a one-liner <laughs> in a session like this. But I have a teaching series on the seven spirits of the Lord that which you may get from our, if not on our book table, you can get from our web store. Uh, it's a long, it's a big teaching series, you know. It cannot be answered in just one uh, session. But just to say in a nutshell, the seven spirits of the Lord are of a higher dimension or a greater flowing than the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. The nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, you can say, is like a stream. And the seven spirits of God is like a river, but they are inside one another. That's good. The way I've already always seen that is gifts, the gifts of Holy Spirit, the Lord says are without repentance, but they're, they're more transitory and made for this realm, whereas the seven spirits of God are an infusion into the, of the, of the character of God into you to cause you to become like God. And so we grow f from glory to glory as that progresses. Okay. If there is a connection with the colors of rainbow, do you start with red and wisdom? This is for you. Is it for me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Truthfully, you start with white. Until you allow Holy Spirit in, and then release him, there will be no facets of color. I believe also that it has to do with your, I call this your spiritual genetic makeup, your spiritual DNA. Because each one of us is inherently uh, gifted, for lack of a better word, or, or aligned in our spirits at a certain frequency to begin at some place with the seven spirits of God but we can grow into the fullness of that whole expression. Thank you. Is Sabbath, Saturday, Sunday, or a shadow of the eternal rest that we enter into? That was yours. <laughs> a simple question, but does not require a simple answer. The Sabbath is definitely Saturday. And simply put, it is rest. However, it is much more than that. When the Lord God rested on the seventh day, and he blessed and sanctified the seventh day, he left it as an example, a type and shadow for what is happening in heaven and what we are going to experience in the millennium. About uh, several months ago, maybe last year, I had a visitation from the Prophet Moses and he spoke to me at great length about the true Sabbath rest. And then he said, this is the real 
teaching about the Sabbath that was originally given by God, which is celebrated in heaven and which will be celebrated in the new millennium. Because it is written in Isaiah chapter 66 that from one Sabbath to another Sabbath shall all flesh come to worship me. So once again, I'm sorry, this is another very deep subject, which I am now writing a book on the subject. So hopefully it will be available soon. Amen. Thank you. Chris, do you want to say something? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> Brother Sadhu, you mentioned that you had an experience of seeing a false Jesus and that you had a check in your spirit have you ever seen a false saint? If so, what did you do? So far, I've never seen a false saint or a false angel yet. So I don't know how they look like. In all my years of uh, working with God, or when I first started seeing the communion of the saints in 1984, January, till now, all this blessed visitation that I've had from the Lord through this communion of the saints, never ever have they ever spoken anything that reflected themselves. They've always glorified God and they've always brought revelation in line with the word of God. And uh, the many, many wonderful <coughs> teachings or revelations that I've received have exemplified what the Bible has taught. So, so far, I've never had any experience of a false saint or a false angel. If I encounter it next time, I will let you know. <laughs> but anyway, the test is, as it's written in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, mm -hmm. the test is whether they will glorify God or they'll claim the blood of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Would you like Do to you add something? No, that's exactly what, exactly what I would have said. Yeah. He's so kind. <laughs> okay. Do you know specifically who the two witnesses are? Moses, Elijah, or Enoch? That's for you. Yes. Um, there's a lot of discussion on that. I've heard a lot of interesting theories on that. My understanding is Moses and Elijah. That doesn't mean that's God's understanding. I think there are certain, I mean, I know he's met them in the spirit. So I'm way out on a limb here. But you know what? Those are good questions. But my question to you is, what are you doing to prepare for that time? Um, Jesus had a visitation of Moses and Elijah. One facet of that revelation that he gave me was that at the end of the age, there will be a generation of people that are apostolic and prophetic because Moses was the forerunner type of apostolic. Elijah was prophetic. So I see that reflection and that understanding, but I still, I still, uh, it's my understanding is it's Moses and Elijah. Go ahead and correct me. No. You know, if the identity of the two witnesses are meant for us to know, the scriptures would have written very clearly. Yes. Right? But God in his goodness and in his wisdom, just love it as two witnesses. Yes. But from the works, we can guess it looked like the ministry of Moses. Mm -hmm. It looks like the ministry of Elijah. So we come to that uh, preface, you know, or un that understanding. It could be Elijah and Moses. But scholars tell us that it could be Enoch and Elijah mm -hmm. because right. both of them did not die. They were translated, or else Moses died. Now, like I told you the other day, 
our understanding of Moses dying and bury, God burying him is not how it may have actually taken place. We don't know. We're just trying to use our own human understanding of death and burial. I have a third school of thought. My, this is not uh, thus says the Lord or anything, you know. It's just that my perception. They are, they are representatives of two companies in the last days. Right. Two witnesses physically on the earth in Israel. At the same time, these two companies all over the world having their two anointings. This is what the Lord showed me last year at the conference in Lancaster, the Moses and Elijah company. So I, I preach over two or three sessions on that. Those tapes are available from Royal Crown or you can order it from Shekinah Worship Center. I'm writing a book on that, expanding, you know, in a meeting sometimes you cannot share everything because for limitation of time. But when I'm writing them, I expand the thoughts, expand the revelation so that it is more meaty. So if God willing, by the end of this year, I hope to complete the book and publish it. Is that, is that still on? Stephen. Has the third seal been broken? Mm. That's for you. <laughs> How can the third seal be broken when the first seal itself is not broken yet? You know, the first seal, it says, a rider on the white horse, and he has a bow, but no arrows. So, and he will go conquering and conquer. So, that speaks of a false man of peace who will use peace treaties to make alliances, pacts with nations without any violence. However, there's a bow there. A bow speaks of a weapon. So there will, he will use threat of war, but not actually exercise any war, therefore bringing them under subjection. For example, if you look at, if you look at the situation in Iraq right now, there's this new group that has risen up called the Islamic State. Are you following the news? Now these guys recently gave an ultimatum to all the non-Muslims in a village called Mosul in northern Iraq. And the ultimatum was, they all convert to Islam. Ultimatum number one. If they don't, then they have to pay religious taxes. If not, they will be executed. See, here is a threat without any violence. So that's what this rider on the white horse will do. He has a bow, but no arrow. So there will be a threat. So far, if you look at the world situation right now, has the rider on the white horse come? He'll go on conquering and to conquer. So he'll bring all the nations of the world under his hand. And when the second seal is broken, red horse, there will be a lot of wars all over the world. So far, what we are seeing, I believe, are the fringes or a preview to all that. We, have not, we are not in it yet. 
I may be wrong. Okay, thank you. The next question is, what does it mean in Revelation 12, 14? Revelation 12, 14 says, But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. That certainly is for you. <laughs> hmm. Because she has got wings, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, let's put it this way. I don't know. Um, quite truthfully, um, no, I'm just going to leave it at that. No. I have nothing to say on that one. The woman is Israel. The nation Israel represents all the Jewish people. So she's given wings to fly. She goes into hiding. And for a period of time, times and a half a time, three and a half years. So that will speak about the end time tribulation period. You know, many years ago, I received a word from the Lord where the Lord said, in the last days, the spirit of Hitler will rise up one more time again. <clears throat> you know, I was preaching in my studio, recording a TV program, when suddenly I saw an angel come and appear, stand be besides the camera. And then he said, look. When I looked, we flew. I was preaching, but at the same time, I find my soul flying with the angel over Germany. So when, when we were above Germany, from the bottom of Germany, a dark smoke rose up. When it rose up, when it parted, I saw a gigantic figure of Hitler standing in Germany. And then the angel told me, this is the spirit of Hitler that will rise up one more time will rise up one more time in the last days and they will persecute the Jews. And when they persecute the Jews in the last days, it will make the holocaust of yesteryears look like child's play. Great, great will be the persecution that will come. So during the times, God will protect his people. So that is why God is calling a lot of people all over the world to set up communes, or like a place of refuge for the Jews. Yes, that's true. I for once know of two people in Australia whom the Lord has called to buy thousands of acres of land to build a community to house the Jews, mm -hmm. to protect them in the last days. Even in the US, I was told yeah. there are many such places. One such place is Moravian Falls. You know, when uh, the Twin Towers were hit, many, many Jews made their way to Moravian Falls. Bobby Connor told me this, mm -hmm. no? They made their way to Moravian Falls. So some of the Christians asked them, how did you know to come to this place? They said, we were told by our ancestors that there will come a time where persecution will come for the Jews when it comes, we should all go to Moravian Falls. So, you see, it's a common knowledge even among the Jewish people mm -hmm. that there are places of heaven where they can go and hide. Perhaps Spokane is also one of them. I've actually heard of a number of those in uh, one in Georgia, I think there's one in Montana. But God sovereignly and supernaturally raised people up with an awareness to prepare for this. There was a time when my dad was traveling, he knows places in Finland and, mm. and different countries. So, yeah. Thank you. What does Revelation 18.4 mean? Revelation 18.4 says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins. And least you receive of her plagues. What, the, what has to come out? 
It's my understanding that's the Lord telling us to come out of Babylon, out of the Babylonian system. We're to be in the world, not of the world, and we're to set ourselves apart. Um, yeah, I'm just going to be truthful. I, I, one of the books I've not studied much is the book of Revelation. And not because I'm not interested, because the Lord specifically told me, you look for me to come every day. Now I have, I'm not as well versed in the book of Revelation as our esteemed brother here, but um, uh, maybe I better study more, huh? <laughs> but that's my understanding of that. What, what say ye? <laughs> You know, one of, when the Lord called me to do this Angel TV television ministry, the call was based on Revelation 14, 6 to 13, the three angels' message. So the three angels that you read in the book, that is you. That is your call. I was very astounded, you know. And there are three angels there. In 2000, when the Lord gave me this call, the name for the network he gave was Angel TV. At that time, I didn't understand the re relationship between this work and Revelation 14. But later on, the Lord told me, what is written in Revelation 14 is the work that you are doing. So there are three, three angels, three messages they carry. The first message is, fear God and give him glory. Amen. And there'll be great judgment upon the waters. This, the Lord told me, started in the year 2007. So in that year, the Lord told me, now preach this message. So from 2007 till last year, we've been preaching very strongly on that first angel's message. And all throughout the world, especially in the eastern part of the world, the Pacific and the Southeast Asia, we saw this judgment of God come upon the waters. Yes. We saw the tsunami came, and then the tsunami in Japan as a result of the flood, and all the torrential rainfall. Then, just early this year, the Lord told me, now the time has come for you to sound the second angel's message. That is, Babylon has fallen. Mm -hmm. And to call the church to come out of Babylon. So now... This is the message we are carrying at this season now. And I've also, we are preparing special programs on our network to proclaim this message. So what is the Babylonian system? See, when the church went into the dark ages, the Babylonian system of religion and worship right. got amalgamated together with the church. But the church got so corrupted let me ask you a question, okay? What has got Santa Claus to do with Christmas? What has got Easter bunnies and eggs to do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Nothing. Nothing. So where did all this come from? We have totally forgotten about the Christ of Christmas and we are focusing on Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. We have forgotten the risen Christ, and we are focusing on Easter bunnies and eggs and chocolates. <laughs> See, Babylon has come in, mm -hmm. totally right. took our mind away from Christ. Thirdly, Jesus Christ was never born on December 25th. That's right. Never. So where did that come from? That is the birth of the sun god. Right. That is another Babylonian practice. Yep. See, all this has crept into the church. See, Mother Mary carrying the baby. Where is it written in the Bible about that? Where did that come from? That is Samiramis. Yep. From the Babylonian pattern. So now we are working on a series of documentaries to expose the Babylonian practices in the church. Mm -hmm. And you know what, what makes my work more difficult is, in India, 75-85% of our viewers are Catholics. 
and they are the largest supporters of our ministry. So I counted the cost. I will rather do the will of God right. than try to please my supporters. Now God is able to rain down manna, right? We have been hearing that. Mm -hmm. So this is where we are right now. Come out of the Babylonian practices that we find in our churches today. Yeah. That lifestyle, the immorality. What does Babylon stand for? Immorality. Idol worship, worshipping of self. Come out of all that. You know, when I was in Lancaster, you, you guys must get the tapes from uh, Royal Crown about the conference we had in Lancaster last week. I had a visitation from the Prophet Moses and he spoke to me about the judgment of God that is going to come upon the US. And what's going to happen now? Step seven points he gave me. And then I pleaded with him. He says, sir, there's something that can be done to save America from all this. He looked at me, you know, like a father. He just smiled. Are you sure they will do it? They are very, very self-centered people. You know, this is, I was shocked. This is how heaven looks at Americans. Of course, not everybody. They are good people. Like the saying goes, no? The good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> so, most of them, they see, see the corporate nature of the United States of America is self-centeredness. That self-centeredness is Babylonian. Mm -hmm. So you need to come out of it. The only way to come out of it, to counteract that, is we start learning to walk in love. Just like what we heard uh, our dear brother Bruce sharing about Bob Jones' experience in heaven. Have you heard of that? When he stood before the angel, before he could enter heaven, they ask him a question. Do you have a passport? She asked him, what is a passport? Good thing they didn't ask for a visa. <laughs> <laughs> what is the passport? The passport is, have you learned to love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all that is within you, and your neighbor as yourself? That is the command of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord's command. The one command that fulfills all the law. So if we learn this, we are out of Babylon. Thank you. When you get downloads of times and seasons for the body, how do you know to release it or not? And especially if you don't have a platform or if you are not recognized as anyone in particular, or you just get these things to agree with God plus pray. This is certainly for you. <laughs> Listen, if, if God is giving you insight and revelation, then you wait on God before you present it. And if it's from Him, He will open a door to present it. If you think it's God and you try and push your way in somewhere, you're wrong. If you receive revelation, you wait upon the Lord and God will always make a way for that revelation to come forth. Could it be He's giving you revelation for intercessory purposes, of course. Could it be that He's giving you revelation to prepare your own life, of course. Could it be he's giving you revelation to share it? Sure. But the protocols of the kingdom decently in an order is you wait upon the Lord and God will always open the door and always make a way. Don't push doors open. Thank you. Okay, now right, it's time begin. for the audience. If any of you have a question. Wow. Okay, first hand. And the rule was, please, no personal questions. 
Good day and God bless. Just two questions. The first one is going to be short and then the second one. But um, Brother Sundaram, you said they'll be keeping the Sabbath in heaven. And what I continually get from people is they say there's no time in heaven. So how could they be keeping the Sabbath? So how do you reconcile the two? He mentioned your name. <laughs> <laughs> Who said there is no time in heaven? Mm. Who said that? But the Bible doesn't say there's no time in heaven. The time that is in heaven is different from our understanding of a 24-hour time period, you know. See, it is God who gave the Jews the seven festivals. All the seven festivals are times observed in heaven. They are times observed in heaven, you know. In this particular time, this needs to be done. In that particular time, this needs to be done. This time in heaven. Like, you see, it is written in Job chapter 1, there was a day when all the sons of God gathered to worship God. See, there was a day, so there was a time when all of them gather in heaven to worship God. That is corporate worship. The angels are always worshipping God. The seraphims are always worshipping God. But there is a set time when all the created angelic beings, the creatures and everybody, they come to worship God. So there is time in heaven. All right. And the second question is, um, uh, it says the body without the spirit is dead. So can you help us to understand when you're here and the body's here, but your spirit goes there, which I guess means it leaves the body, how... How does that work? And what's the difference between soul and spirit? That's for you. Next question. No. <laughs> the body without the spirit being dead is talking about the cessation or the finishing of your course in this life. To have spiritual experiences the grace of God comes to sustain your mortal body. Uh, Brother Sadhu talked last night about in this generation, we're going to see the young people be able to outrun the chariots. To, the supernatural, I mean, that's not natural. But God is able to circumvent the design of physics and nature that he created. The spirit, soul, and body, I, now I, Brother Sadhu and I were talking about this a little bit. Your, your, your soul is your, your thought processes, your intellect. As I said the other night, we're always talking about souls being saved. Your soul is not saved. Your spirit is re, reborn into, into the kingdom. Your soul has to be renewed. Your mind has to be renewed and transformed. And your body has to be submitted to your spirit. And your soul has to be submitted to your spirit. So the, for God to intersect and, and do something on that level, I mean, it's not that big a deal. But um, go ahead. You've got a scripture to go with this. Hmm. You know, to answer your question, if you read uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, yeah. verse 6 and 7, <clears throat> there it says, or ever the silver cord is loosed, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher is broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Right. Now there is a silver cord, a cord that binds our spirit to the body. It can be explained like the umbilical cord that is attached to the baby, to the mother. So likewise, there's a silver cord. And it is very long. If you are taken in the spirit to heaven, the silver cord is never cut. It just goes on and on and on. The silver cord is cut when we die. That's why it's written here. The golden bowl is broken. The pitcher is broken. The will is broken. But only at the moment of death, this cord is cut. So the spirit cannot come back anymore. 
But in normal times, until the time comes for us to die, the silver cord is never cut. So when you are traveling, God graces us by His mercies. When we travel in the spirit, the body is not in a state of like what I said the other day, the dead knows nothing. The, the body is like in an unconscious state. It's not dead, it's just unconscious. But at the moment of death, the cord is cut. Once the cord is cut, then the body, the dead knows nothing. Thank you. And Brother Sadhu, a couple of years ago, the Lord revealed to you the coming war to Israel. And I'm interested in current events and the war that's going on with Israel right now. If God has spoken anything further on that revelation, does this have anything to do with that? As a matter of fact, just this morning I had a, a visitation from an angel and he spoke to me about the war in Israel. See, all this is building up. See, if you look at uh, what happened in Gaza and Israel right now, as a result of the war in Gaza, there's a, a wave of anti-Semitism all over the world. Yes. Because of that, the Jews are coming back to Israel. Now, the scriptures tells us that they should all be regathered back in Israel. So, if there are good times everywhere, how are they going to come back to Israel? See, because of the war in Ukraine, the Jews in Ukraine are coming to Israel in the thousands. France. There will only be, and, and of course France, France also, you know, they are moving out of France to come back to Israel. Mm -hmm. So the only place of safety for the Jews in the last days is Israel. No other nation will be safe for them. But this is not the mother of all wars. They are just building up towards the big ones. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so my question is in regards to Job 1 that you just raised. Um, when the sons of God came before God, um, why is it that Satan himself showed up even though it was fallen? Um, can you, can you please uh, expound on that? I didn't quite get all of that. So he, Job he one. asked when, the, when there was a day when all the sons of God gathered before God, how is it possible for Satan to also present himself there? That sounds like your question. <laughs> I, you know, we're kind of having fun, but with the amount of uh, experience Brother Sadhu has had in that regard, I, I want to hear this answer too. You know, I myself am asking God, <laughs> how in the world the Lord allows Satan to come and stand there? I myself am asking the Lord, how is it possible, Lord, for you to allow him, the fallen one, to come and stand there? And I also ask the Lord, how is it possible for you to allow the devil to carry you during that temptation, you know, to even touch the Lord? How did the Lord allow that? How did Michael allow that? They were all were standing there. You know, Rick Joyner had written a beautiful book called When God Walked the Earth. Have you read that book? You should read that book. It's also available from our web store. He was allowed to see from a spiritual point of view what took place when the Lord Jesus was on the earth. In the Gospels, you read from an earthly point of view. But he was seen from the spiritual point of view. So he saw... Michael, all the angels standing guard with the Lord Jesus. And I personally have seen many visions like that. So I saw Michael always standing guard over the Lord. So I, when I saw the temptation in a vision, I wondered, you know, 
when the devil came, all the angels drew their sword to strike him. But Michael said, put your swords down. We have no orders to prevent him from coming near the Lord. Mm -hmm. So the, the scripture says, no, Satan has been given a time. So till that time, he seemed to have access to come and stand there and issue bold challenges and make all kinds of accusations. So this is another mystery that I don't know. Perhaps our dear brother has some answer. My understanding of that was this. When God created the first man, Adam and Eve, he gave them a metron of rule and dominion. And they had access into the very throne room of God. When they sinned, they gave that badge, that pass, that place of access and the dominion over this earth to him. So because of covenant, God's covenant, he doesn't break his word. And that usurper that became the God of this world, he still ha he has access in place of the first Adam. And, and until that's eradicated, that's why he has been allowed access. That's been my understanding. That sounds very logical. Yeah. Thank you. But is it spiritual? Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree with that. And my question is about the false prophet. Is there any link between the false prophet and Catholicism and the Pope? And if not, where do you see Catholicism and the Pope in the last days in relation with Israel? And also, any revelation have you had about the trumpets that started, I think, in 2011? Has the Lord showed you what the meaning of those trumpets were? Are they heralding just what's coming to pass? Thank you.